Hi, I'm Darlene Carmen. And I'm Doug Carmen. And welcome to the show. In his book, 19th Century San Jose in a Bottle, author Tobin Gilman reveals the life and commerce of early San Jose through the prism of antique bottles. Today, we will see some of his antique bottle collection and hear related stories from his book. Hey, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> I understand uh, you're a marketing consultant uh, and bottle uh, collecting is your hobby, right? Yeah, I spent uh, about 30 years working in the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley and other parts of the country. And about two years ago, I retired from the corporate lifestyle, and uh, that gave me a little bit more time to pursue my bottle collecting hobby and motorcycles and other things. Oh. And uh, so I consult, do marketing consulting for um, high-tech companies as a part-time job now. But you started much earlier than that. When did you start bottle collecting? A long time ago. I was actually in eighth grade, and uh, this kid in my math class brought this old bottle to school, and he was showing it to the teacher, and I, I just was fixated on how cool that looked. And he was explaining that this bottle was in the 1800s and that he had dug it up with his father. And uh, that just got my, my juices going. And uh, in the weeks that followed, I started uh, scrounging around the creeks and the ranch lands around San Jose and looking at old dumps and started digging for old bottles. And it just kind of <laughs> snowballed from there. <laughs> Your book specifically covers uh, bottles in San Jose. Uh, and I guess that's what you collect. Why is that? One of the things you learn when you start uh, getting into this hobby is that if you don't specialize, you're going to have a house full of bottles. And uh, I was starting to accumulate just boxes and boxes and boxes of all kinds of <laughs> bottles. And so what you'll find is that collectors will specialize either on a certain type of bottle, like old medicine bottles or whiskey bottles or soda and mineral water bottles. Other people will specialize on a region or a city like I've done. Others will specialize even on a particular proprietor. So for me, San Jose was kind of a logical thing. I spent most of my life here. I moved to San Jose in 1966, uh, the summer before fourth grade, and I went all through high school here and then left. Came back about 16 or 17 years ago and have been here ever since. And so this is my home, and I have a lot of interest. And the bottles just tell you a lot about life in San Jose back in those days. Mm. Uh, your book is divided into several businesses that use bottles for the manufacture of their products. And I didn't realize that there were so many drug companies downtown in San Jose, like in the 1890s. Why were they so popular? Well, you know, the 1800s were really the heyday of the patent medicine era. Um, there weren't a lot of controls about what you could sell, what you could put in the bottle, and what you could say about your product. And so there were some really outrageous advertisements and claims for all these remedies and cures. And um, we actually had a few of those from San Jose themselves, guys that actually developed drugs that they sold nationwide. But uh, the thing you have to understand about the drug uh, business back then is we didn't have a lot of hospitals. We didn't have ambulances that would come and pick us up and take us to the hospital in the case of an emergency. We didn't have doctors that made house calls regularly. And so people relied very heavily on, on their druggists. By the late 1890s, there were somewhere between 25 and 35 druggists in San Jose. And mind you, the population was only 20,000. Yeah. So, you know, we had a drug store for every 750 people or so. Well, not only that, in your book, the hours seemed to be a big issue. They would have competition between the different druggists about how long they're going to stay open. Because when people get sick, it's usually right in the middle of the night. Yeah. <laughs> and so that seemed to be an issue, too. Yeah, it, you know, it was. And uh, a lot of these guys actually slept in the back of their stores at night. So if somebody did have an ailment and it was an emergency, they could, um, they could be there to assist. And there was a lot of organizing among retail druggists across the country in the late 1890s, and that found its way to San Jose. So there was a period there where they started organizing and uh, trade associations were formed, the Retail Druggist Association specifically, and they tried to mandate hours. And there were some druggists that didn't want to go along with that, so there was a little bit of controversy. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, since you list all these druggists, was there any one of those druggists that kind of stands out in your mind? That or something, somebody that said, "Hey, I like this guy," or or he was a real villain, or something. The yeah. particular that yeah. really yeah. caught your interest yeah. in a particular druggist. 
You, you know, um, there were a few that are particularly, they're, they're all interesting characters. They I'll, are. I'll tell you as you yes. research them. But uh, one of the druggists in town was a, a guy by the name of Augustus Schoenheit. And he was one of those druggists that actually had his own products that he manufactured and sold across the country. Um, one of his products was uh, a product he called that wondrous liniment. And this was something that cured, you know, about 15 different diseases that I couldn't even, <laughs> half of them I couldn't even pronounce. Small bottle for yeah. him. <laughs> um, and uh, another one of his products was that A1A specific self-cure. Um, A1A specific self. Now this, this was actually advertised as a cure for gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly enough, I actually met uh, his great great grandson. He he bought the book and contacted me and was kind enough to come out to my house and show me some of the artifacts from his um, ancestor's store. And he told me a story about how Mr. and Mrs. Schoenheit had a son, and the son um, had a list of girls in town that he was not allowed to dance with, presumably <laughs> because they uh, they used uh, <laughs> they used the product. <laughs> so so that, was, that was one of them. That was one of them. Another what? one was uh, a. Uh, a gentleman, he was either a physician or a, uh, a veterinarian, and nobody really knows for sure. But he had a product <laughs> called um, HHH Horse Medicine. Mm. And this was a product, like a lot of these patent medicines of that era, that was um, a cure for both man and beast. And if yes. you look at the advertising, um, it, it's kind of funny. The ads will list about 15 diseases that it'll cure in a human and then it will list another 15 or so diseases that it'll cure in a horse. <laughs> and then where it gets really interesting is the dosages. The, uh, the dosage for a human is 20 to 30 drops, and the dosage for a horse is one to two tablespoons, which I think is about, about 20 to same. 30 drops. <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of these cures. And uh, you know, a lot of them, by the way, went beyond, uh, beyond San Jose. The very first bottle I ever dug up was, was this bottle here. And, this is uh, the great Dr. Kilmer's Swamp Root Kidney Liver and Bladder Cure. Oh. And you'll notice it's in oh. the shape of a little kidney here. Um, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. He also had a heart cure and, uh, and a liver cure. So there were a lot of those kind of drugs. But you know, th this thing with the, uh, the horses and stuff, we actually have, I won't mention the name, I don't even know if I know it, but we, uh, we have something that is for uh, animals uh, oh. in our medicine cabinet. Oh, it's a bag we, bomb. Yeah, oh, shh. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, we use it. We take it out and we use it for like an anesthetic. And um, it's like a Vaseline or, kind of. Yeah. And, and it's Nero's one farm, container farm. and we've had it forever. It just never goes away. But, I mean, oh, that yeah. we bought it at a pet shop. <laughs> it was recommended to us. So maybe that wasn't so strange after all. Maybe I not. Maybe I don't, not. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, well, so, so you mentioned how many drugstores there were. The heyday, how long did this last before? Well, what, uh, what started happening was uh, probably the biggest change was in 1906, the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Yeah. And that um, was really a truth and advertising piece of legislation. It, it prohibited false claims about what the product would do. It actually didn't do much to restrict what you put in the product. But, and by the way, a lot of these products had either uh, alcohol or opiates <laughs> or a course. combination of the two. <laughs> but uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act really kind of began to um, mark the beginning of the era of regulation. And um, so as the years went on, there were obviously more regulations that went on. And then the other thing that happened, like in a lot of industries, there was consolidation. You know, today, if you go to the, the pharmacy, you can go to Rite Aid or CVS or Walgreens, and that's kind of it, right? But yeah. uh, so yeah. the industry has just evolved. Hmm. It took a while. Well, that was one product, the, the drugs. And then um, we did a show a few years ago on the mercury at the Almaden mines. And we didn't know at that time that mineral water was also very popular in the 1800s. So I'm wondering, how did the two businesses coexist? Yeah, so, like, yeah they're so closely related. I'd be kind of scared of what uh -huh. was in the mineral water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did well, that work? It, it's funny. I'm a, a volunteer docent out there, and it, it's it's funny because obviously the attraction is the mercury mines, but I always steer visitors to the mineral water first. And yeah. um, but uh, no, actually, what happened? There were actually two companies that bottled uh, mineral water. There was a natural uh, spring along Los Alamitos Creek that had natural carbonation in it, 
and um, they would bottle the, the water. In fact, this is the very first company that um, uh, bottled mineral water. This was Thomas and David Williams, the Williams brothers, and their partner, Winslow. And uh, this actually was bottled as New Almaden mineral water starting in 1854. And then in 1870, another gentleman began bottling mineral, mineral water, a Frenchman by the name of Francois Pioche. In fact, I think we have an image of one of his bottles, if we could bring that up on the screen. Um, but Pioche was a very wealthy banker and investor, and he began bottling water out there under the brand name uh, New Almaden Vichy Water. So we actually had two companies that bottled water there simultaneously. Um, there was no, uh, to the best of my knowledge, contamination in terms of mercury getting in the water. Mm. Oh, really? but, but what actually uh, closed down the, the uh, uh, water operations was the source of the natural carbonation was underneath one of the mine shafts, the Buena Vista shaft. And they were doing some drilling one day around 1880, and they punctured that shaft. And the uh, carbonation source was destroyed, and that pretty much put an end to the, to the bottled mineral water. Now, oh. if, you, if you actually, if you drive out to New Almaden today, you can actually look over Los Alamitos Creek at the bridge there, and you can still see an occasional bubble coming up. So there's a little bit left. But they had uh, mineral waters and, and this natural carbonation and all that. That was prevalent through a lot of places in this area, wasn't it? It was. You know, uh, people have been, quote, taking the baths for thousands of years. In fact, the, uh, the Rome goes back to the Roman era. The oldest uh, yeah. mineral springs is Bath, you know, now part of England. Yeah. Um, and it caught fire here in the United States in the late 1700s. And uh, initially in the Saratoga region of New York, in fact, I'm actually descended from Nicholas Gilman, who is best known for signing the Constitution, but he actually <laughs> also discovered the original Congress spring in Saratoga, New York. Wow. And by the 1800s, there were hundreds of companies across the country that bottled natural mineral water, mostly for therapeutic purposes, um, health purposes. Um, one of the uh, uh, other bottlers of mineral water out here in this area was the Saratoga Pacific Congress Spring. Mm. Now, the story behind this is they discovered mineral water there in the 1850s, and they, they realized after doing some testing that the properties of that water were very similar to the properties of the water in the original Saratoga Spring of New York. In New York. So two uh, wealthy entrepreneurs, uh, Alvinza Mills and uh, Alvinza Hayward, I should say, and uh, Darian Ogden Mills began bottling water out there in the 1860s. And then they later built a hotel and it became a very luxurious resort. And they named their water the Pacific Congress Spring after the Congress Spring in the Saratoga region of New York. And that was why the town of Saratoga is named what it is. Prior to that, it went by various names. It was for a while called Bank Mills. It was called Tollgate, McCartysville, and then sometime in because the 1860s the springs, they settled it. Yeah. Its name. Correct. In fact, we have a, one of those bottles too. We could put that up on the oh, on the. Yeah, uh, there it is. On the. You know, that's a very uh, beautiful bottle and, and quite rare, I might add. The uh, the hotel actually burned down in the early 1900s. I think it was 1903. And then for a number of years after, it was used as a dance pavilion and a place for picnics. But by the 1920s, it kind of just fell into disrepair and eventually became purchased by the Water District, and it's owned by the Water District to this day. So According oh, <laughs> so I was just going to say, so a lot of the, the, the mineral water just dried up. Is that it? Essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sad. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the other thing that happened is uh, soda pop became popular and people began to shift from drinking mineral water for medicinal and therapeutic purposes to more as a beverage. And, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, of course. Well, that kept the company still going. They just switched to soda pop. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. that's exactly yeah. right. Well, according to your book, um, the beer industry in the San Jose area was uh, brought over by, by the German immigrants. Um, how large was that industry in San Jose? Because there was a lot of German immigrants in San Jose during that period, I understand. Yes, in San Jose and Santa Clara, there was a very strong German community. They, uh, they brought with them their, their brewing craft, along with their craft for uh, sausages and meats. And uh, there was a family that operated a large tannery in Santa Clara. Um, but in terms of the breweries, we had a pretty active uh, industry. There were seven or eight 
large breweries. The uh, in this area in San Jose. In San, in Jose. San Jose itself. In San wow. Jose, um, wow. and, and the largest of them was the Fredericksburg Brewery. That actually commenced operations in the 1860s. In fact, we have a, an image that we can put okay. up of the building while I'm, oh, I'm speaking look at about that. it. Oh, Magnificent. This was, uh, this was the largest brewery west of the Rockies uh, oh. throughout the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. It looks like a castle on the Rhine. See that, uh, the decoration there on the, what is that, turrets, what do you call that? That's, yeah. th th those are called turrets, and it was often <laughs> compared, you know, to a, a German it does, uh, it does. Rhine castle, <laughs> for sure. There were, uh, there were two artesian wells below the facility that they got the water from. That's where they got their, their, their water. So. How yeah. convenient is that? Very, right? <laughs> well, one of them was uh, 175 feet deep. I think the other was 500 and something feet deep. But uh, they sold beer all over the world. Um, wow. They had their own, um, their own bottlers, um, their own bottling plant, and then they also had bottlers around the country that bottled them. In fact, if we can shift images, I'll show you some of the bottles from the Fredericksburg Brewery while we're, we're oh, speaking here. Oh, look at here. that. All different sizes. Uh, yeah, so you know, beautiful bottles. Most of them were made in Illinois. There were some that were also made in Germany as well. That they had shipped to them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those are nice. So when you find a bottle, how do you determine its age? There are really a lot of different ways. Um, generally, the line of demarcation for de determining whether a bottle is considered an antique bottle or not is at the turn of the century, actually 1903, the Owens automatic bottle making machine came into uh, existence. It was patented at that time, and by the late teens, maybe early 1920s, virtually all bottles were machine made. Mm. Um, but mm. practically by about 1905, they were um, mostly machine made. So prior to that, every bottle was hand blown. There, there were glass houses and artisans, glass blowers, that would take a, a, gla a blowpipe put hot silica at the end of the blowpipe, blow the glass into a mold. Most of the molds were hinged. Then they would remove the glass from the mold and do various finishing work to complete the bottle. And one way you can tell the age of a bottle is by looking at the mold seam. If you look at a, at a modern bottle, you'll see seams on both sides that go all the way to the top of the lip, all the way to the very top. If you look at hand-blown bottles, you'll find the mold seams tend to taper off around the shoulder or just below the lip. So the mold seam is one way of kind of determining that it's at least before 1900 or the very early 1900s. There are other ways you can um, get a little bit more specific. Up until about 1865, one of the finishing techniques was the use of something called a pontal rod. And what um, a pontal rod was, was it was a long, rod with a little ring at the end of it. Yeah. And when the bottle came out of the mold, they would dip this little ring in molten glass and stick it to the bottom of the bottle. Um, and that would give the, uh, the bottle maker something to, to hold it, and then he would do the various finishing. And then when the bottle was completely finished, they, they would break it off. Oh. In fact, if we could go to the image of the pontal mark, I think that's in our mm. portfolio here. Ah. That's called a pontal scar. And uh, there were a variety of different types of pontal scars. There are graphite pontals and iron pontals, and that's called an open pontal, but mm -hmm. the principle's the same. And so that generally will tell you that a bottle is pre-1860s or at least pre-1870s. So that's broken off, right? That's, that's chipped broken off. off. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. You, I've seen that in bottle. I mean, that's it. Yeah. So what made that special? Well, What's just special about it is just knowing that that's a, a way of determining the age. Yeah, of the you know that it was hand bl blown, mm -hmm. yeah. and then uh, there was an age that, during a period of time that they used that mm -hmm. in handling the bottle, right? So exactly. that you can yeah. pretty much state uh, how many workers now hand blowing is quite a, seems quite laborious when you have, uh, and I understand in the book uh, you mentioned it took several people to um, make a bottle. So how many workers and how many bottles could they make, let's say, you know, hand-blowing them rather than, you know, the autom versus the automated yeah. Yeah. system? You know, there, there were a lot of variables determining the type of bottle they were making and the particular glass house and the proce process. But generally, there would be one person who operated the blowpipe, uh -huh. often called a gaffer. And then you had a lot of boys, a lot of teenage boys 
they were called glasshouse boys. And there were mold boys that would get the molten glass onto the rod for the bottle blower. There were boys that uh, brought finishing tools. And, you know, there was actually, uh, the, the glass houses actually put a lot of the spotlight on child labor laws. And a lot of what happened in the glass houses um, helped spawn those child labor laws. Yeah. Well, you know, as a production, let's say the beer company, as an example, uh, they put out a lot of beer, I understand, the Fredericksburg... Uh, we program. were thirsty, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to provide those with bottles, that's why they had to go overseas and, and back east to get the, the number of bottles they needed yeah. before the automation. Is that, that's right. I would assume yeah. that would be... So. They, had, they got bottles from all over, if I remember yeah. right. They got it from different states besides California. Yeah, so, you know, to, to your point, you know, the, the capacity was probably around between 500 and 1,000 bottles per glass blower <laughs> per day, per doing day. it the hand way. Um, the automatic bottle making machine uh, quickly got up to about 60,000 bottles a day, so you could, you could definitely see the economies of scale here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that's so cool about these hand-blown bottles, though, is that every one of them is like a snowflake. There were all these different unique tooling marks. When you look at these old bottles, you'll see bubbles in the glass. You'll see whittle marks in the glass. You'll see drips of glass where the top was applied. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's fascinating. Wow. Well, also, it's what makes it kind of unique because, uh, let's say, a druggist or or a particular small company could have all could contract and have their own specialized bottle made, and uh, and that's I assume that's what they did. That's right. And that's you know, how they, you can yeah you get those such unique uh, individual bottles. Now, do you find bottles from because they had to import, especially for the beer? Do you find a lot of other bottles from around the country? show up when you're looking for bottles that might that ended up in wherever in the dumps or whatever? Yeah, yeah. There were a lot, first of all, there were a lot of products that were sold nationally. Um, you know, even household brands today like Lee and Perrin's Worcester sauce was around in the, uh, the 1800s. Um, but yeah, you know, um, uh, proprietors would get their own names put in the mold. What's, what's kind of fun mm. about all these downtown Those are the things. unique ones you really like to yeah, collect. Yeah, yeah. These, these guys had their addresses on them as well. Yeah. You, you got some interesting bottles here. Did you want to talk about any of these? I, I, I'd like to talk about color. I don't think we've mentioned being an artist, I like color. Uh, I, I wanted to know, um, I remember my mom was into bottle collecting for just a short amount of time, and she always praised the, uh, the blue, the cobalt blue. Was that special? Is there any particular color? I mean, we've got three pretty colors here. Is there any particular color bottle? Does that have anything to do with the collect yeah. the value? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, great question. Uh, you'll notice a lot of the bottles sitting on this table, like this bottle here, has that aqua yes. color to it. Yes. That was caused by iron impurities in the silica. And uh, um, one of the techniques that they discovered in the 1890s to, to clarify the glass was to add manganese. And uh -huh. manganese actually worked as a clearing agent. But what they learned was that when you expose the glass to ultraviolet light, it would begin to turn this amethyst purple color. So if, if it was left out in the sun, ah. they, they found a cure for this, a remedy for this in around 1917. But this amethyst is very popular with collectors. A lot Beautiful. of people will dig up their bottles and they'll put them in the They're window. They're looking for amethyst <laughs> bottles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you asked about cobalt. Yeah, you cobalt, asked about blue. cobalt. Cobalt blue is very, uh, very desirable, and that's actually uh, created by adding cobalt to the well, glass. That's why they call it cobalt blue. That has my curiosity of how, then how valuable can some of these bottles be? You know, when you're talking about something unique, is there something that's really a yeah. prize bottle that yeah. all the bottle he's, collectors he's are trying to find? He's not going to tell you. I got a feeling yeah. he's not going to tell you. These bottles here are worth millions of dollars. <laughs> uh, you know, you know the, the reality of it is, uh, 99 out of 99 out of 100 pre 1900 bottle. Are, are not worth much at all, $5 yeah, the or, or abundance, less. They're still, because they don't break down in, uh, in the environment. Yeah, they're just common. But, um, you know, the collectible bottles, most of the bottles that we're seeing here on this table are bottles that are uh, worth between maybe $10 and a couple of hundred dollars. But they can get up to thousands of dollars. And, and I've actually, there, there's bottles that have been auctioned off for 250000 Wow. Now, so. is that, you're looking for the imperfections. Is that the deal? It's, it's a lot of things, Darlene. Rarity is obviously the, the yeah, biggest thing. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Rarity and uh, so is there any particular, we've got a couple minutes left. Is there any particularly bottle you want to talk about? I'm afraid to touch them. I want to show, you a, I show you a fun one here. Just uh, okay. This isn't a San Jose bottle, but I think your viewers will uh, probably recognize the name Martinelli. Um, so in, uh, we all drink Martinelli sparkling cider, right? Um, yeah. You've heard of that? Yes. So in the 1860s, Samuel Martinelli was a Swissman who came to California, settled in Watsonville, yeah. and started bottling uh, carbonated cider, apple cider. It's so and, small. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> this is one of the original Martinelli cider bottles from the 1870s. And oh, wow. this is a family-owned business that still exists in Watsonville. It's still yeah. owned by the Martinelli family. Oh, my goodness. So, so that's kind of a but fun the one. the bottle is so small. You notice that. <laughs> yeah, that's a couple yeah. of swigs of cider. <laughs> yeah. Now, if people want to collect bottles uh, now, what should they do? Uh, is, is it, where should they go? How do they get started? Yeah, you know, when I got started, uh, you know, it was a lot easier to go digging in the old dumps and all that. <laughs> you know, today, you know, most of those places have been cleaned out, and it's a lot harder to get, you know, get access to them. But uh, um, there are active bottle clubs um, here in San Jose. We have a San Jose Bottle Club, and there's a national organization called the Federation of Historic Bottle Collectors, and um, that's an umbrella organization for bottle clubs across the country. So anybody can go to their website. It's uh, FOHBC, Federation of Historic Bottle Collectors. Great source of information. Um, and among the other types of information they provide are information about bottle shows. And we have bottle shows in Northern California. There's one, uh, there was one just last week in Morro Bay. Mm. Um, there's one coming up in Santa Rosa. Uh, they have one once a year in Auburn. So there are you know, quite a few of them. Ah, well. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I think we could go on for another half an hour easily talking about bottles. We barely got started. Yeah, really. we didn't get to talk about the top. Oh, there's so many things that are fascinating. I that it's I, what we read. What's neat, you have, you have quite a bit of it covered in your book. And, uh, yeah, about the bottles. But I just want I, to say that there is one question that we all should ask ourselves. Hundreds of years from now, when the generations in the future are looking on our trash, I'd like to know what they'd think of the trash we leave behind, especially the plastic bottles. Thank <laughs> Ooh, you for I watching the, the show. Bottle. Watch again. Check the <laughs> website uh, for more information about Tobin's lectures and so forth around the area. So thanks for watching the show and watch again. Would you please sign my book? I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Thank you. It's fascinating. Yeah, I found it very fascinating.